Good morning, good afternoon, good evening from wherever you're joining. Thank you for being here today for another NCAR Explorer Series conversation, streaming live from our homes to yours. My name is Dr. Dan Zitlo, and I'm an educational designer here at the National Center for Atmospheric Research, or NCAR, which is a world-leading organization dedicated to understanding Earth system science, which includes our atmosphere, our weather, our climate, the sun, and the importance of all these systems to our society. We've got a really great panel planned for y'all today with both scientists and educators, where we're going to learn more about just how interconnected our Earth system is and how we're working on collaborating across different disciplines to tackle these really cool and complicated challenges. We're also going to talk about some student opportunities and the ways that we as scientists communicate about all the really rad stuff that we do here at NCAR. So throughout this event, you'll be able to ask questions and engage with interactive polls using Slido. So if you just scroll down your webpage just a little bit, you can join Slido and answer some of the polls we already currently have available, particularly the, the work lab that we have about uh, what's causing our climate to change, as well as a poll question about what's the difference between weather and climate, because we're going to get to both of those very soon. Now, I also want to note that this conversation is being recorded, and we're going to share it out on our NCAR Explorer series website uh, within the next couple of weeks. Now, before we check in on your thoughts on some of those poll questions I just mentioned, I want each of our panelists to quickly introduce themselves. So panelists, go ahead, turn on your cameras. Uh, we've got Dr. Donica Lombardosi, Dr. Adriana Bailey, Mr. Jerry Ciccone, and Dr. Lorena Medina Luna. So Donica, can you go ahead and get us started with those intros? Yeah, hi, I'm Donica Lombardosi, and I am really passionate about how plants interact with our climate. So I think about things ranging from how air pollution affects plants, how climate is changing the food we'll eat, and how we can use plants to combat climate change. Adri Great, thanks. Uh, Adriana? Hi there. I'm Adriana Bailey, and I'm an atmospheric scientist at NCAR, and I think specifically about the water cycle. So I ask questions like, you know, where does your rain and snow come from, and how far has it traveled to get to you? Why does it rain more efficiently sometimes than other times? And how do all these processes affect clouds and climate? Um, at NCAR, I work in the Earth Observing Laboratory, where we maintain two large research aircraft. Uh, and those aircraft are for the purpose of putting instruments onto the plane to fly them up into the sky and measure things like the amount of moisture up there, the winds, the temperature, air pollutants, and lots of other things. And I have to say one of the things I like most about my work is that we maintain these aircraft for university use. So through field campaigns, I get to interact with a lot of university professors and also students who are getting used to this idea of putting instruments up into the sky. Awesome. And thanks for that mention of field campaigns. It's a huge part of what we do as our scientists. Uh, uh, Jerry? Yeah, thanks, Dan. And I'll talk more about some field stuff, too, uh, when I get a chance to talk later. But hi, everyone. I'm Jerry Sacconi. I am the NCAR uh, Student Program Coordinator in Education and Outreach. And so I uh, lead or co-lead multiple internship programs and also help coordinate programs across the organization. Awesome. And now Lorena. Hi, everybody. It's the first time I'm on this side of Explorer Series. Um, I lead the Explorer Series typically um, coordinating with scientists like Donica and Adriana and with educators like Jerry um, and also with our multimedia services to ensure that we have programming available for the general public. And I've also worked with undergraduate students doing science communication workshops and um, supporting different programming that's going across the institution. Um, we also have our traveling climate exhibit, which is currently on hold until travel is available and things are a little safer. So I'm really happy to be able to share a bit more through this panel. So thank you for having me. Great, thank you everybody for those introductions. Uh, now let's check in on that work lab I, I had mentioned before. Brett, can you go ahead and put that up for us? There we go. So what are some things that have been contributing to our changing climate? Um, and the one that stands out to me is humans. 
Uh, I also see CO2 fossil fuels, greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, let's see, unsustainable agricultural practices, waste, transportation, fuel extraction, sun cycles, politics, forest depletion. Sounds like our audience has got a great handle uh, on, on some of the things that are impacting our, our planet now. Now, before we, before we dive in, um, I know one thing we're gonna be talking a lot about is both weather and climate. And Donica, I had the question, you know, what is the difference between weather and climate? Uh, but before you, you tell us more about that answer, let's go ahead and see what our, what our audience thinks. And it looks like the trending answer is F, both B and C. So uh, climate is the average of temperatures over a long period of time, and weather is the way we are feeling temperature right now. Uh, Donica, can you give us a little more insight on, on that answer? Yeah, sure. Um, so a lot of times we talk about climate as being your personality and weather as being your mood. And so climate is the longer term average over time and weather is the shorter intermittent um, what we're feeling right now. And so I like to think about this in a way of climate determines where our plants are growing. So for example, we are we grow crops in Illinois rather than Arizona because Arizona is usually too dry to grow crops um, on a large scale. Whereas weather is you know, what happens from year to year. So if a crop field gets flooded one year, that's due to weather, that doesn't happen every year. So those are the, those are the big differences that I think about between climate and weather. Awesome, Thank, thanks for helping us understand that. Uh, we can go ahead and stop sharing the screen. And now we're gonna hear from both Donica and Adriana all about the connections between agriculture, the water cycle and our climate. So Donica, take it away. Great, if we can um, share those slides, yeah. <clears throat> Perfect, so um, today Adriana and I are gonna be talking to you about some of the exciting research we get to do as scientists at NCAR. Next slide, please. We are all water for and why we water our crops. But did you know that plants can affect climate too? I'm gonna to turn off my video because I think my internet is being a little slow. Um, next slide, please. So if we think about a house plant, you probably have all had house plants at some point in your life, or maybe you have them now. When you have a house plant, you have to you know that you have to water it pretty regularly. So why do you need to keep watering them? Where does that water go? What do you think? The short answer is it goes back to the atmosphere. So let's talk about that. Plants, next slide, please. Um, plants get water from the soil. Next. Water travels from the roots through the stem and into the leaves. Next. And then it evaporates from the stomata. And the stomata are these tiny pores on the bottom surfaces of leaves. And that process of, of water moving through the leaves is a process of transpiration. So that's what we call, and that's plants moving water. Um, it's it's a, basically a water pump, <laughs> if you wanna think about it. Next slide. So that transpired water, when it goes back to the atmosphere, it can condense and form clouds. And so that's one way that plants can influence our climate is by changing clouds. Next slide. So I'm gonna jump in here and ask the question, so how do we know that plants are actually moving moisture into the atmosphere? How can we tell? And there are a couple of ways, but I'm gonna focus on one particular observation that we can use. It's a pretty special observation um, that allows us to kind of fingerprint where that moisture has come from. And for, for the purposes of kind of explaining how this all works, we're gonna to go to a place where there's actually a lot of plants, the Amazon rainforest, so lots of trees in this case. And one thing you'll, you'll see from the, the photo from Reuters down below on the right is that you know, it really makes a big difference visually, for one, when you replace the trees in the Amazon with, say, agricultural fields. But what we're also going to find out is that it also makes a big impact for the water cycle. And that has implications for the climate system. 
So for the next few slides, I really want you to kind of focus on this orange box area, kind of over Brazil and the northern part of South America, because we're going to be looking at some fairly unusual views of this area. So keep in mind, this is the area we're talking about. Let's go to the next slide. We're going to be looking at this area from the lens of a satellite instrument, which we're going to see in just a second. There it is. The Tropospheric Emission Spectrometer, or TESS, which is a NASA instrument that flies aboard a satellite called AIRS uh, that I've used several times in my research, though here I'm going to be highlighting some work from, from other colleagues, work that I wasn't directly involved in. And so what we're going to be looking at is down at the Amazon again from what TESS, TESS is seeing. So let's see that in the next slide. What we're looking at here is how much moisture TESS is seeing in the air in the lower troposphere, the lower free troposphere over the Amazon. And so you've got two snapshots that you're looking at and they happen to be two snapshots in time. On the top, we're looking at the moisture over that Amazon region for what's considered a transition season or the very end of the dry season before the wet season kicks in and it really starts to rain in the Amazon. And what you're looking at at the bottom is then what the moisture in the air looks like um, over the wet season. So this is how much water is in that air. And basically the darker blue tells you that there's more water. And if you look at these two snapshots, you might you know, sort of scratch your head and say, okay, I think I see some small differences, but there aren't tremendous differences between these two images. Let's look at the next slide. So here's what Tess sees when you ask, what type of moisture is in the air over the Amazon? And here you get a really different picture. You start to see some stark differences between this late dry season, the transition, and the wet season below. I mean, for example, if you look at the top right panel, what you're seeing is a lot of green moisture in the air. Um, and then of course that seems to disappear. So what exactly do we mean when we talk about different types of moisture in the air? Let's go to the next slide and take a look. So what we're talking about is that there are different flavors of water. You know, typically when you think about water, we're thinking about H2O, which is this top molecule that I put here on this slide. It's considered isotopically light, but there are some other variants of water that have an, either an isotopically heavy oxygen, that's H2H2O in the middle, or that they have an isotopically heavy hydrogen, HDO, which is the molecule in the orange box. And I've highlighted HDO in this case because it's actually a molecule that tests the satellite can detect. And so I actually work with these isotopic variants of water a lot to try to track moisture through the atmosphere and fingerprint where it comes from. And we can do this from satellite as we're gonna be looking at today, but we can also do this with instruments that we put on the aircraft at NCAR and fly through the air. So for the purposes of today's talk, you know, the really important difference between H2O on top and HDO on the bottom is that the isotopically heavier molecule is, think about it this way, it's a little more sluggish. So it's slower to move around, it's slower to diffuse, and it's slower to evaporate. Okay, let's go to the next slide. So if you're thinking about that schematic of a tree moving moisture around in the Amazon, let's first focus on what's happening at the ground level. You know, here what you're looking at is moisture from the ground surface, from the soil, maybe from little puddles or rivers or lakes evaporating into the air. And remember that the HDO, the isotopically heavier molecule is a little bit slower to evaporate. And so it tends to get left behind in the soil moisture or in the river or in the lake. And so what you see is that there's this tendency to favor the H2Os through a process like evaporation. Now contrast that with what you're looking at with transpiration, which is the water that the tree is moving from the soil into the atmosphere. Trees, plants, they're very good at moving all types of molecules, whether it's H2O molecules or HDO water molecules into the atmosphere. And so transpiration actually has an isotopically heavier signature. All right, so let's go back to those satellite views of the Amazon on our next slide. So when we, we're going to look down on the Amazon and are in a couple slides forward, if we can just advance to. So now we can be a bit more precise in thinking about what does it mean to be looking at different types of moisture over the Amazon. What Tess is actually seeing is isotopically heavier moisture over the Amazon 
in the late dry season, in that transition phase before the wet season and all the rain really kicks in. And so that's really what this green is representing is it's isotopically heavier conditions suggesting that the plants are transpiring a lot of moisture during that period and really helping to moisten the atmosphere. And if you will get it ready or precondition it for the convection that really takes over when the rainy season kicks in. So next slide, our take home message is that it's really the tropical plants that are helping to trigger their own wet season. In other words, the trees themselves are actually helping to create some of their own rain. So next, what happens then if we end up cutting down these trees, for example, to make room for an activity like agriculture? Um, you know, again, we saw this image before from Reuters, you can see the stark difference in just the visual imagery, but what does it really mean for the water cycle? Well, let's take a look at this one example on the next slide. This was a simulation done um, a few years ago, looking at asking the question, what if you cut down 40% of the trees over the Amazon? What would happen to rainfall? And what you're seeing are the reductions in rainfall. On the left-hand side, it's for the wet season. And on the right-hand side, it's for the dry season. And those reddish colors in both cases are a reduction in precipitation of say 10, 20, and then in the dry season, even 40% over large portions of the South and even Eastern parts of the Amazon basin. So, over the Amazon, we sort of get this one picture that, um, that as you cut down trees, you know, what we believe is that you end up reducing the amount of moisture that those plants put into the atmosphere. And so that can actually result in climate changes like reducing the amount of precipitation you have. Now, I know I already mentioned that I wasn't directly involved in these studies that I presented today, but this kind of work has inspired myself and my colleagues at NASA to start to ask questions like, okay, we now have several decades of water isotope observations from satellite. Are we seeing variations in the balance between the transpired or evapotranspired water and precipitation? And how are those variations, you know, what do they look like over time? And are they related to variations in the climate system that we're seeing? So there's one last point I wanna make before I turn it back over to Donica and we can go to the next slide for that last point. And that is that, you know, I've given you this one story or this one perspective from the Amazon, what happens when you cut down trees, say, to put, put agricultural crops in. But the answer for other parts of the world really changes depending on where you are. In other words, just because you put crops in doesn't mean that you're necessarily going to reduce transpiration and precipitation. In fact, in some regions of the world, you can have quite the opposite effect. And Donica is going to talk to us about that next. Yeah, so following up on what Adriana just said, if we plant crops in dry regions like this in this photo, which is in Palisade, Colorado, on the western side of Colorado, it's really dry. It's actually all, it's a, pretty much a desert. And so when we plant crops in regions like this, we have to add water to those crops so that they can grow. And so crops in a region like this can have a very different effect from crops in a region like the Amazon where we're cutting down the forest. So if we go to the next slide, you know, I, I'm curious, what is the impact in dry regions? And oftentimes in dry regions um, or in, you know, regions like the central U.S., which is not quite as dry as Palisade, but crops are planted where grasses used to grow. So what would happen if we ripped up all of our croplands and went back to grasses and planted grasses again? So I was curious about this, but I how, how do you think that we can find out? This is a hard question because we don't actually want to rip up all the croplands because then we wouldn't have food to eat. And so one way that we can find out is by using a virtual earth simulation to test these different scenarios. So we can go to the next slide. Virtual Earth, what I'm talking about is taking what we know about the Earth and translating it into mathematical equations. And then we can run these equations on a supercomputer to simulate a virtual Earth. And that way we can make changes to our virtual Earth and understand what the impact that those changes have without actually making drastic changes to our planet and having those consequences. 
So this is, I wanna also highlight that this is how we know about climate change. We can test, we can test our um, earth in this virtual earth format and, and better understand what's happening from climate change perspective. But today, um, if we can go to the next slide, today I want to focus on thinking about how agriculture can change clouds using this virtual earth. So can agriculture change clouds if we, if we, um, if they're, if crops are planted in areas where there are grasslands instead? So in one virtual earth experiment, we'll have crops planted everywhere that they're growing and those crops are watered and they're fertilized. And then in another virtual earth simulation, instead of growing crops, we're gonna grow grasses, which are not watered and not fertilized. So which do you think is gonna have higher transpiration? These managed crops or these natural grasslands? Let's find out on the next slide. Remember that plants pump water from the soil into the atmosphere through that process of transpiration. And so in this map, what I'm showing is the change in transpiration from crops. And so anywhere that you're seeing those blue colors are, is an increase in transpiration. And so if you look in the middle of North America where we grow a lot of crops, the more productive crops are pumping more water back into the atmosphere than grasses. And so we're increasing transpiration in this region where we're grow, where, um, where crops are normally, crops are currently grown instead of grasses. What does that do to clouds? Let's find out on the next slide. So what happens is when crops pump more water into the atmosphere through transpiration, there's more water in the atmosphere that can then condense to form clouds. And this is exactly what our virtual experiment suggests. In crop regions, again, if you look at the central part of North America, the cloud cover increases and that's the, the blue color again shows that the cloud cover increases. So let's go to the next slide um, and just look at this image because the virtual earth suggests that crops planted in grassland regions can increase clouds. Um, if you look at this picture, you see that there's shadows on the ground and that might make you realize or remember when you stand outside and a cloud goes in front of the sun, it gets cooler. And so clouds can actually, um, it can cool air temperatures in those regions. Um, it also, you know, when you see a cloud, usually it means that maybe there's some rain coming. And so clouds increase rainfall because that's where the precipitation comes from. So I just wanna hand it back over to, to Adriana because we've been talking a lot about these um, these local and regional effects, but, but I think plants can actually have a much bigger impact in other places. Yeah, I'm, I'm glad you mentioned that, Donica, right? I mean, we've kind of given these two different pictures where, you know, if you think about putting crops in the Amazon, like a rainforest, it means it implies that you're going to have to cut down trees and that's going to have one effect where we think it's going to reduce transpiration locally and that's going to reduce um, precipitation over the Amazon area. And then you showed a very different picture where, you know, if you add crops to an area that was, you know, drier grasslands and then manage those crops with water, you end up putting more moisture into the atmosphere, which can result in more cloudiness. And of course, clouds are where rain comes from. And you've also said that it has these temperature effects too. So two really different local effects that you can get from having crops in different places. But I think the important message to leave everyone with today is that you know the effects aren't just local. And we're gonna see that on the next slide with a quick video image. Once you get moisture into the air, that moisture can really travel around. And in some cases it can travel all the way from very low latitudes to very high latitudes. And so when you have water cycle effects in one area, one small area, even if it's a small area, if those effects are big enough, it can actually have implications on much wider regions or even globally. So that's the message we wanted to end with today. Wow, that's such a great message that you were able to share with us. And it also just totally blows my mind that in some places the like, trees can actually create their own rain sometimes. That, that's crazy to me. Um, we're gonna take a quick question from the audience and it's, 
you may or may not be able to provide some insight on this, but we talked a lot about you know, how plants and trees and agriculture can affect the water cycle, but this question is about affecting the carbon cycle. Um, and so Janice wants to know, uh, how can we use agricultural systems to possibly store more carbon? Great, I'll jump in and take that. There are several ways that we can use agricultural systems to store more carbon. And um, the scientific community is still exploring a lot of these. And so um, sometimes, for example, we can leave crop residue on the ground and that can increase the amount of carbon that's going into soils. We can also stop tilling our the, the ground and that leaves more of that soil carbon intact. So there are several ways that we can use different agricultural management practices to change the amount of carbon that is going into our ecosystems and being stored. And a lot of that storage is happening in soils and not, um, carbon storage happens in plants as well, but when we're using agriculture like crops and we're eating and consuming those plants every year, the carbon is not gonna be stored as much in the plants as it is in the soils in those ecosystems. Awesome, thanks for telling us about that. Uh, so audience, definitely keep popping your questions in there. We'll get to them as, as many as we can. Uh, but now we're gonna head over to Jerry. So we've heard a bit about the science and now Jerry's gonna tell us uh, a bit about different ways that students can get involved. Great, thank you, Dan. Uh, hello again, everyone. Uh, yeah, as uh, Dan said, I get to talk to you all about how students can become involved in the science that we do here at NCAR and also some of the things that go into participating in one of our programs. Uh, I'll also discuss how I became involved as a student and how that led me to my position as a student program coordinator, coordinator excuse me, but we'll do that a little later. Uh, so to begin, let's start with the student uh, opportunities, which we have quite a few. And just FYI, before I jump in, I just want to let everyone know that our summer programs have gone fully virtual again for 2021, unfortunately. Um, our hope, though, is to have them back in person in 2022, fingers crossed. We already have run uh, one full summer of internship programs virtually, so we kind of feel like we know what we're doing now. So uh, we think we can improve upon that going into the, this summer. Uh, next slide, slide, please. So we, uh, let's go back one more. I want to go to the research slide. If you could, perfect, thank you. So we offer opportunities for students at all stages of their ac academic career. And since NCAR is a federally funded research facility, if you participate in one of our programs, research is likely to be a large part of your visit. In many cases, that includes being paired with a mentor or mentors and conducting research on projects in atmospheric science, computational science, engineering or space and solar physics, and that's just to name a few. And often the research being done is on new and innovative top topics in Earth system science, which can really be exciting to be a part of and a great learning experience, quite honestly. Next slide, please. When participating uh, in an in-person internship, some programs actually require data collection in the field through observations and our measurements as part of their research. Past interns have participated in field work at local rivers by measuring steam, stream flow and turbidity. Uh, you can see that picture on, on the bottom left uh, of the slide uh, or have launched weather balloons. You can see that on the right hand of the slide. Students have even constructed and monitored weather towers at our Marshall Field site just south of Boulder. And in doing so, they, they've collected temperature, humidity, precipitation, wind speed and direction, and also solar irradiance data. Um, personally, just speaking, uh, it's one of my favorite things to do with students is to set up weather towers since my background is in meteorology. Uh, next slide, please. Something that I think is invaluable, quite honestly, when you participate in one of our programs is the opportunity to build relationships with scientists and, and staff from across the organization. And students do this through mentorship and, and lab meetings. Uh, and also students have the opportunity to network within their cohort and across internship programs through events such as workshops, uh, lunches, uh, et cetera. And I'd like to say, uh, also that many of the connections that our students make while participating in our programs, uh, they have for the rest of their lives and, and sometimes even end up working or collaborating with professionally along their way. Something in my short time in this position that I've learned in, in uh, bringing in 
uh, alumni from our programs is they keep in touch. They keep in touch for many years and it, it's a wonderful thing to see. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, to help build the students' career skills while they're with us in, in, a, in a program, we offer pro professional development workshops for all of our students. Uh, and there's a list of them there. I'll just kind of run through a few of them. We have leadership training. Uh, we do a diversity, equity, and inclusion session. Uh, there's also, we do science communication workshop uh, to help the students learn how to communicate the work that they're doing to the public and to others. Uh, and also, we host an end of summer virtual poster symposium. Well, it was virtual last year. Hopefully, we'll go back to in person here soon. Uh, but a virtual uh, poster symposium uh, where many of these skills are quite honestly put uh, to test and, and are put to practice by giving the students an opportunity to present their summer work to staff and peers across the organization. It's a great opportunity for the students overall, and it helps them prepare for um, our, our, some of our meetings like the American Neurological Society meeting in the winter and the American Geophysical Union meeting, AGU. Uh, and oftentimes the program will actually pay for the student to attend one of those meetings to present their work, which is a great opportunity. Next slide, please. And of course, we, we have fun along the way. Um, what's doing science and research without having some fun, right? So we go on field trips, we go on hikes, we do this one in person, obviously. And we also have game nights and movie nights just so we can all connect and, and kind of uh, decompress from doing science during the day. And it's, it's a great way to, to build community. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, right here, we have a list of some of the programs that we offer for both undergraduate and graduate students. Uh, I'd like to say through these programs, we are especially focused on supporting students from groups that are historically underrepresented in our fields of study. And if you'd like to learn more uh, about these programs specifically, you can click on the link uh, that is provided on this slide uh, at the bottom of the slide. And it, we have what basically was set up for our, um, for our conferences, uh, a good uh, web page that has I think all of our programs listed with their links and some information about them. So it's a good uh, spot to go to to kind of have everything right there so you could look through our programs. And that's it for me on the on the student opportunity side, Dan. Great, thanks, Jerry. Uh, I also know that you had, you know, kind of a non traditional way into the sciences. Did you want to spend, you know, a minute or two telling us about that? Sure, I, I would uh, love to actually. Uh, I, I started at NCAR uh, as a student assistant uh, working for NCAR scientist Dr. St uh, Scott Landolt in 2016. Uh, Dr. Landolt was also one of my meteorology professors at Metropolitan State University here in Denver, and that's where I received my bachelor's degree. And that uh, happened after starting my degree in the mid-90s at Florida State uh, and then dropping out and bartending for about 20 years and then deciding uh, to go back to school. Uh, to finish my degree. Uh, for Dr. Lando, I did research. I did coding for him on a few of his projects. Um, but after helping out with several summer inter internship programs, uh, I discovered that I really enjoyed working with, with students. And I decided to take a chance and begin the process of transitioning uh, to education and outreach. And it, I was lucky at the time, uh, there was a position in NCAR's education and outreach office uh, for student program coordinator. And so I applied to that and um, was offered the position and, and gladly accepted. And, and part of that had to do with the relationships that I had built working um, over the summers with the student programs. Um, as a student program coordinator, which I've now been in this position for about a year and a half, but I've been at NCAR overall for uh, five years. Uh, I have the opportunity to recruit for and run internship programs. I host the professional development workshop series that you saw a couple slides ago. Uh, also the poster symposium uh, and overall work to coordinate the many student programs that we have across our organization. Uh, I'm a queer first generation non-traditional college graduate from a low income background, background growing up. I love meteorology. I love working with students from all backgrounds, particularly those underrepresented in the earth system sciences. And, I, and so I feel really lucky and uh, that I get to bring all of those things to my work every day. Awesome, thanks for sharing all that with us, Sherry. And it really you know, sounds like 
there's lots of different ways into the sciences and there's you know lots of different things you can be doing to be involved with the sciences so with that we are going to hear from Lorena for a little uh, for a little bit uh, but before we go there, I want to uh, check in with the audience really quick uh, about their thoughts on if there's room for storytelling in science communication. So if you haven't already voted, hop on over to Slido really quick to tell us your thoughts. And Brett, can you go ahead and post up that poll for us? So it looks like so far there's a resounding uh, yes. Uh, Lorena, do you want to give us some uh, insight on that? Yeah, thank you for sharing that um, Slido poll and thank you everybody for participating. Um, and I'd like to ask if Aliyah, you can please share the slide deck about science communication as a form of storytelling. And I'd argue that yes, there is a space for telling a story when we are communicating science. And I think it's one of the ways that we can actually connect with the people we're talking to or with especially if they're not in the sciences themselves, especially if they are not doing that type of research works. Because sometimes, you know, um, scientists, even though they work in the same field of atmospheric science, they'll do different specialized parts of that um, question in mind. So I think storytelling is definitely a connection to the community. It's a, why should I care? Why does this even matter? And I think that's one of the trickiest parts of my job is working with scientists to get them to a position or a place where it's it's changing the way that they talk about their science rather than, you know, we do a lot of conferences, like Jerry said, going to um, national conferences, talking with different scientists about the research that we do. People might be familiar with the topic, but when they're not familiar with the topic, for example, with these Explorer series, we're talking to a a lot of people from a lot of different backgrounds, a lot of different career levels. So how can we get the scientists to engage differently with their science? So hopefully we've been doing a good job with those, um, but it does take a lot of work on our, our end. Um, get to meet with the scientists ahead of time, a couple of times actually, to talk about who's our audience, how are we gonna engage with them? And again, how does the work that I do impact you? and how does it impact the people around us it's not just a siloed in the lab or you know now in your home office thing that we're doing but it it, it really does matter for the grand scheme of things um, and so what i do is a lot of talking with scientists i also do interviews with dan we both have been working on the ncar explorer series videos which means that we get to also travel for field campaigns, you know, pre-COVID times, we went to Argentina for the Relampago field campaign, which we do have a explore event about that. And we also got to go to Costa Rica in 2019 to talk about tropical um, storms and how they form in the equatorial region. So I've learned a lot, even though my background is in science, it's in geophysics. So I actually studied earthquakes. Um, so it's a different field and I'm learning a lot, but it's, it's the ways that we can get scientists to to kind of let us know in a good scientific way, but not too um, jargony way, like not using all the acronyms all the time, uh, to be able to, to talk with people and create these science stories and videos that are exciting. So definitely check those out. They're under the Explore Series Field Campaign campaigns video page. Um, and then I have also done interviews with people. So I have to sometimes be behind the camera as well. So that's a little bit more intimidating, but I think that I've learned a lot with the working with scientists to feel comfortable with how do I then frame the story? Cause it's always easy to ask the questions. It's just, <laughs> I feel like it's a little harder to, to, to be the one that's answering them. And can we go to the next slide, please? And one of the other ways that um, we think about sharing our science is engaging with people, not just through video or through in-person lectures, but also going out to the community. So on the left, you'll see some pictures when we were in Argentina and then um, coworkers that were in, in Costa Rica working with students directly to feel like scientists. They helped us blow up a balloon for a weather, um, a weather balloon. And you know, on the bottom, they were able to actually release the weather balloon um, as needed to collect data. So making people feel like they're scientists from an early age and they have that strength to continue on with what they, they would like to pursue. 
Um, but there's also, again, the traditional ways that we communicate science, you know, poster sessions, writing blogs is a newer thing that you can do. Um, and also just the, the, the regular uh, publication. So I do a lot of bilingual science communication. So we are doing some Spanish Explorer series events as well. And it's, it's trying to reach broader audiences, trying to reach a different demographic of people that may or may not be um, so into science. But once they like participate in it, I feel like it's, it's kind of cool. <laughs> um, they get really excited about it. And I'm excited about sharing um, the, the work that I do, but also sharing the work that all the scientists like Donica and um, Adriana have done. So that's a little bit about the background of, of what I do with science communication. And in general, I think finding something that you're really passionate about, um, something that makes you feel proud of the work that you're doing, and something that you feel excited to get back to after the weekend. It's, it's part of the job, but I think it's also part of the way we engage with each other, especially now in this virtual world. So. Awesome, thanks for sharing all that. And you know, one of the, the neat things about your story, Lorena, is you, know, you were a geophysicist and then moved into science communication. So you know, going back to the point that Jerry made, it takes all types of people you know, to be involved in the sciences. Um, I also just want to quickly note, we had Rosa pop in the chat really quick and say, uh, Dr. Medina, uh, you went to the Rodampago field campaign in Cordoba, Argentina. One of our students, Miguel Cortez, participated. Excellent experience. So thanks for that shout out, Rosa. <laughs> yeah, and it's always real awesome to be able to reconnect with people. I think that's the networks that Jerry was talking about. It's You never know where these connections are going to lead you to, but it's definitely um, a growing opportunity, which is also amazing. So hi. <laughs> Great. Well, we're going to take the last 15 minutes here to dive into some of our uh, questions from our audience. Uh, so it looks like this is, this is a science one, maybe for Adriana or Danica from Don, asking, are crops in dry areas like Palisade, uh, quote unquote, stealing moisture that would naturally be in other parts of the area? Yeah, thanks for your question. Um, so, you know, Obviously, if we you know, use water, you, you have a limited amount of water, right? And so these are a lot of societal choices that we have to make based on things like, where do we need to grow food? And you know, where do we need to use that water? And is it important to use water for this particular purpose? You know, those are questions that science can certainly play a role in helping, but at some point they become value decisions where society has to make a choice about those things, right? And so um, if there's one thing that I guess I would want to convey as part of our presentation, it's that there are these hydrological connectivities between places. And so realize that as you're using water in one place, it can have implications for other places for sure. But again, it's, it's a much bigger decision than just you know, one water cycle scientist like myself can help answer. Yeah, it also gets back to that you know, one thing that I think a lot of our scientists are interested in is that systems connection, you know, so how, how are all these things kind of affecting each other, because nothing happens in a silo, right, you know, what happens in the Amazon is also going to affect us here in the US too. Uh, cool, so Michelle has a question, how do instruments measure the increase in carbon in the soil from composting or paralysis, uh, no-till practices, and other carbon sequestration processes? Yeah, that's a, a great question. And um, it's not something that I do myself, but there, there are instruments, oftentimes you go out and you take soil samples and there are instruments that can measure the amount of carbon that is in the soil. And so soil contains a lot of different things, but carbon is one of them. And that's, um, that's a big one for climate change because it's carbon dioxide in our air is a, an important greenhouse gas. And it's one of the main greenhouse gases that humans are emitting and, and releasing back into our atmosphere. And so taking that and being able to store it in the soils is a really important component, but it can get carbon in soils can get stored in different forms. Some are um, more what we call recalcitrant, which just means that they stick around for longer. And so we can also measure the different types of carbon that are in our soils. Um, and so there, there are different instruments and different ways of doing that. And there's a lot of research right now trying to figure out how soils can best store carbon, how much carbon they can store. So all of these things come into play and it's a really active area to try to figure out 
And maybe a question for Adriana, is there any way that we can study some of that uh, with remote sensing? Like, do we have to physically install maybe sensors in the ground to measure some of these things? Oh, that's a question I wish I knew the answer to. So I don't know as much about remote sensing of the carbon cycle. I'm really sort of, you know, I focus so much more on the water cycle aspect of it. Um, you know, and in general, I, I can say at least on the water cycle side, things like getting a evaporation fluxes, like being able to really measure that uh, moisture leaving the soil, it's hard, right? Because you're going through all of the atmosphere and through clouds and potentially through vegetation. Um, but that's why, you know, the, the one particular tool that I showed today, the, the isotopic tool can be so valuable because it's sort of this record of where the moisture had come from previously. I don't know if Donica has a better insight into whether we can remotely sense any of those um, carbon cycle properties. Yeah, so soil carbon is, um, is not something that we can remotely sense at this point. We can, we, we ha we're gathering new ways to remotely sense the amount of carbon that's in plants, for example, and that plants are taking up from the atmosphere. And so that's one way that we can start to get at the carbon cycle from remote sensing, but we don't really have good measures of soil um, soil data and in fact you know even globally the soil when people go out and measure we try to put it into a or take those measurements and insert them into a global database and even that has a huge amount of uncertainty because of the different ways that we measure soil carbon and also the soil layers can be really really deep and so we can't always easily get to those deeper soil layers and estimate how much carbon is in those either so that's the thing that is still really challenging for us in the science. Yeah, this sort of brings up, I'm gonna jump right back on Donica's point because it brings up a really interesting um, interconnected need among different science disciplines is you know, even if you're mainly relying say on remote sensing instrumentation, you often need to have um, in situ what we call measurements taken in place to actually do some validation or make sure that your remote sensing models that you use um, to interpret what you're seeing from the remote sensing instrumentation, you wanna have these sort of ground checks in place. And, um, and that's a place where we definitely need a lot more data, um, both on the water cycle and the carbon cycle side, is making sure that we have the measurements we need of um, some of these really important, whether they're reservoirs of water or carbon or fluxes of water and carbon, so that um, we can make sure we're interpreting the remote sensing data correctly. Great, and I see a bit of a follow-on question uh, for Donica. Are there any studies being done to explore crops that can bring moisture to arid communities and regions such as in Africa? Hmm, let's, I, I'm not sure if I fully understand the question, but um, are, I guess is the question asking whether or not we can change plants that would change moisture in Africa, is that the? Question. Yeah, it sounds like is there you know any work being done where you know can we plant crops or plants or something in a, in a particular area that's region. super arid that will help bring water to that area? Oh right, yeah. Well, um, so it is something that we can think about, and one of the things that we think about is is how we change our land use and 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 how that can impact climate. And so, for example, one. You know, one thing that people have thought about is trying to grow trees again in at the edge of the Sahara Desert, and so that's that's something that people have thought about, um, and and what that would actually do to climate, and could that start to trigger its own precipitation feedback cycle, which is um, some of what Adriana was talking about a little bit earlier, and so those kinds of things um, have been discussed, and and we can start to think about those, but it. There's, there's a lot of variables that go into them. And so again, we, you know, these virtual planet simulations are really helpful in using some of the remote sensing or large scale um, observational data sets that we have can, can really help us to understand what is actually happening in reality. Does it match what's happening in our virtual Earth simulations and trying to better understand this. But one thing that I thought was really um, interesting was putting solar, this is a, again, another scientific study that was using a virtual planet simulation, but putting solar panels at the edge of the Sahara to generate electricity. But because those are dark, it's changing the amount of sunlight that's being absorbed at the Earth's surface. And that actually also had a climate effect um, that was changing, it, it ended up changing precipitation in some of those regions. So anything that we do to change the land surface really can change the reflectivity of the land surface. It can change the amount of water that is moving around. 
um, and it can change the whole air system. So that's why it's important to both have observations and virtual planet simulations that we can use to try and better understand this question. Awesome, thanks for that insight. Um, and we'll, there, there's a bit of a geoengineering question coming up, but we'll, we'll circle back in a little bit. I first wanna ask uh, Jerry, uh, what do you wish you knew going to an NCAR internship and what insight would you share with students? That's great, Dan. Thanks for that. Um, and thanks for whoever asked that question. Um, well, first, I'd just like to say, honestly, in, in my case, um, I would have liked to have known how much coding goes into science research. Um, I didn't know that off, offhand. Um, I, after bartending for 20 years before going back to finish my school, uh, finish uh, my degree, um, uh, it was hard to jump behind the computer and sit and cold all, code all day long when you're used to interacting with people. Um, I didn't realize how much that would affect me. Uh, and it was part of the reason why I decided to start working with some of the summer programs and working more in education and outreach. Um, I, I'd like to say just the, the point of an internship kind of is to figure out those things, right? So um, some of those things you're not going to come to the table with knowing already. That's what the internship is going to provide. So trying to <clears throat> trying to become involved in internships will help you figure out where you want to be, uh, where you want to, you know, where you want to be in this field. Uh, it helped me realize that I wanted to go into education and outreach. <clears throat> Excuse me. And really that there are so many paths out there uh, in science and this panel and everyone involved in this panel is a great example of that. We, we all do different things. We're all connected to science. I didn't know that education outreach, outreach was a, a route, a possible route for me. Uh, once I realized uh, that it was and I loved doing it, I kind of just ran with it. And now I feel like I'm doing what I should be doing. I really enjoy it. So just overall, I would say, you know, you're not going to know a lot of things before you go into an inter internship, you may have an idea, you know, of some of the things that interest you, but take advantage of internships, apply to them, find out what you want to do. And I really, one thing about being a non-traditional student and taking a long time to get here, um, I kind of in the past few years and while I, I was part, while I've been participating at NCAR and working at NCAR, it's, a, it's allowed me to figure out what I love to do and where I should be. Um, and I recommend the same, you know, find what you love to do, seek it. It will make every day in your job um, that much easier, that much more enjoyable. Yeah, great answer. And, and you know, it's, I'll reiterate, it's okay to not know, you know, science is a process of discovery. That's what we do as scientists is we are curious enough to explore the unknown. So it's okay if you don't know, you know, just get out there and ask questions. Yeah, um, yeah. Dan, can I just say, I, I, I didn't figure it out until in my mid forties. Like, yeah. you know, I, I got there eventually, so it's okay. But it's it, sometimes people's paths are longer than others. That's all right, and that's okay. And a quick follow-up question for, um, for really all, all of y'all, uh, for middle, from Michelle, for middle school, high school, and college students, what programming language should they learn to be able to use these earth simulations? There's a, there's a lot of different languages out there. Um, and so especially these big virtual planets, they still use Fortran, but I wouldn't necessarily say that you need to be fluent in Fortran in order to, to use the virtual planets, but knowing some underlying structure of code can really be helpful so that you can, um, you can translate what you know into Fortran if you want to change some of the model code. But the model development for these big virtual simulations, um, it's a, you know, hundreds of people are contributing to this. And so it's not just one person that's doing it. Um, I'm gonna let Adriana and Jerry chime in and um, Lorena as well, if she, if she has some insights. But for me, I've used um, R, which is more for, a lot more the ecological community uses that, but it's a free programming language that's really great um, and has a lot of help online. And I also use Python and that has been, it's being used more by the earth sciences community these days. And it's also free and there's a lot of resources online. Yeah, I was going to echo some of that, Donica. There are a lot of choices, and I think people, you know, do tend to maybe use different languages depending on what subset of science they're in. That said, I think you could almost jump into any one, right, that's readily available to you. If you kind of get your feet wet with one of these, 
it becomes much easier to use another. And I say that a little bit from personal experience. In graduate school, I think I was taught three different languages because each professor knew a different language. And you know, so I didn't learn any of those three particularly well, but you know, you, you get sort of get the gist of the coding exercise from one of them and it makes it easier to move into another. So um, you know, going with a free or open source language is certainly um, a nice choice, but I would definitely say just get started, just try one. Yeah, if, and if I could piggyback on that too, uh, and yeah, definitely jump on it sooner than later. I wish I would have. Um, but when I when I first started in the mid '90s, you know, the cl the coursework was Fortran um, in college for meteorology. Uh, I am the newest one to have graduated just because I went back to school uh, as a non traditional student. And so I took um, Python and uh, it, as my computer programming class. But yes, Python and R, and I'd also just like to say MATLAB. In my time working for Scott Landolt. Uh, we used a lot of MATLAB. So if you can jump on that and become familiar with MATLAB, I think that's um, smart to do. Awesome, thank you. Um, okay, we only have a couple of minutes left. I wanna quickly address Michelle's question about geoengineering, um, which I think is a little bit outside of all of, our, all of our specialties, but this is something that we are trying to figure out at NCAR. But Michelle is asking, what are your thoughts about folks seeding clouds with sulfur? And does that have hidden consequences that impact climate downstream in ways we don't know? Which might be a really tough question to answer in one minute. <laughs> but does anybody wanna try and tackle? Well, I can start by saying that, you know, this is a really fresh area of research. You know, lots of people are starting to dig into this. It's, it's really hard to figure out how to do this in an ethical way, right? Um, which means you can't really run experiments outside. So we're doing a lot of virtual world experiments like Donica mentioned. Um, and I think, you know, one of the surprising things that I've learned in some of the early studies I've seen come out is that there can be big implications for precipitation patterns, which weren't necessarily expected at first, because you know the whole point of some of these exercises was to see if we could cool, um, have a cooling effect. So I think there's lots to be discovered still, and that means you know there's lots of research to be done. Yeah, I'll just echo that and say you know it's a lot of times what people are doing for the geoengineering is something like seeding clouds to make things cool, but then it does impact precipitation as Adriana said and um, I also just wanted to add that if we keep emitting more and more carbon into the air while we're cooling the air because of those clouds as soon as we stop seeding those clouds we could see temperature spikes really really high so you know like Adriana said there's a lot of ethical questions that we need to be really aware of um, in these kinds of in these kinds of exercises and so there's you know using the virtual world is a, a great way to try and get at these types of questions, um, but we need to be careful in terms of how we think about applying our knowledge. Awesome, which might be a great way to, to wrap up, right, of how interconnected our Earth system really is. Um, and thanks to Michelle, too. I'm really, I'm really glad this webinar helped you fix your direction. So thanks for that. Um, and, you know, thank you, everybody else, uh, for just your great questions, your great thoughts. Thanks to our panelists for sharing your knowledge. Um, as well as the team behind the scenes with all, for all y'all's support. Uh, if any of you are interested in more NCAR Explorer series conversations or lectures or events in general, uh, you can check out our website for both future as well as past events. And I also encourage you all to look at the links that we posted up in Slido where you can go check out some more of the work that all of our panelists have been talking about. And so I hope to see y'all next time and have a great rest of your day. See ya. Thank you.